Dependency injection or dependency management. It's one of these topics that a lot of developers don't like to talk about too much because it sounds complicated and it's a topic that looks simple at first, then becomes very tricky, then simple again, and then you realize that it is in fact rather tricky. A lot of us will manage our dependencies as protocols and then inject instances of these protocols in our objects. But in this video, I would like to show you an alternative to this approach where we focus on using closures as dependencies instead of protocols. If you're not yet subscribed to this channel, make sure you do that right now because I post a lot of videos like this and I know that people want to learn these things, so subscribe. I'm also working on a course that highlights Swift concurrency and takes you from being a novice to being an expert, so make sure to check that out. Links down in the description. Okay, let's get into it. So protocols, as I mentioned, are the de facto way of injecting dependencies into objects, or rather, they're a way to abstract your dependencies so that you can inject them into your objects. And in this video, we're going to take a look at how we can take a protocol-based object and turn that into something where we leverage closures instead of entire objects to manage our dependencies. The practice of doing this is sometimes referred to as using protocol witnesses. So if you want to learn more about that, protocol witnesses is definitely a term that you could look for uh, to see more resources. Okay, so dependency injection is a topic that I won't go into too much. Um, it's generally whenever we inject an instance of some object, for example, a networking object or a caching object into another object so that the other object can use the original object to do stuff. For example, you're injecting a caching layer into your networking object and your networking object into your view model so that the view model can execute some network calls and the network call can then use a cache to write or read contents as needed. A classic example of protocol-based injection could look a little bit like this. We have this caching protocol defined. It has a read and a write function. We can either read data from the cache or put data into the cache. Um, and the networking provider depends on a cache object. Now, this is a very simple example, and it might be too simple for you to actually say, well, this is problematic, we should change this, but bear with me for a moment. So we inject an object that conforms to the caching protocol into our networking provider. This provider can now interact with the caching object as needed, and if the provider only uses a subset of functionality on the caching object, for example, it only reads from the cache, but it never attempts to write, that means that we have to inject all functionality even though we only need part of it. Might not be a problem in your app, but once you start writing unit tests, this can become quite tedious because you're having to create mock functions and mock objects that have a lot of empty functions or a lot of properties that you don't actually need, and you're really just satisfying the protocol when all you want to do is write a unit test that verifies that your networking object reads from the cache as you want. Again, the dependency that I've just shown you is very small, so it might not be a problem. But now imagine a larger project where your dependencies will have other dependencies and they will have a lot of different functions that you might have to mock out. And you're now writing a lot of code and having a lot of overhead just to build a unit test that verifies one single method call. When we inject closures instead, we can update our code to look a little bit more like this, where the networking provider no longer depends on an entire object, but instead it depends on a closure called a read cache. So we can pass whatever key we want to read from the cache and it will return data. Now, instead of having an object that implements a read function, we now just have a closure that performs the work that we need. Mocking this is a lot easier because now we can only mock out the things that we need and we only inject functionality that we need. So we're no longer having an object that does a lot of things, but we only need a few things. Mocking this out is a lot more straightforward than mocking an entire cache object. Of course, closures do have some limitations. The first one being their readability, of course. A closure is a lot less readable than a normal function in general. However, there's a more important one where there's even some cases where using a closure almost doesn't make sense anymore. Let me show you an example of that. 
if we update our caching protocol to look a little bit like this, where we use generics to actually be able to read or write something that's either decodable or encodable, and we don't know what it's going to be up front, so we just pass a generic T. A closure cannot represent this, right? So if we have dependencies that look like this, the closure does not allow us to have a generic T added to it. So we could wrap things around and we could make things work if we really wanted to, but that's quite tedious and complicated and it might not be worth it. If you want to go all in on this approach, it's probably worth writing these wrappers around generics and, and doing everything that needs to be done. But in smaller apps, maybe that doesn't make sense, especially if you're not using generics a lot. So mocking your dependencies with closures is a lot easier, but there are some um, limitations there. For me, uh, this approach has been a huge productivity boost in large projects. I cannot emphasize this enough. For smaller projects, I don't tend to do this a lot, but in large projects, I do like to swap my protocols out for closures where I just inject a closure that performs a single task instead of an object that does a lot. Especially if I'm also focusing on unit tests in the large project, I gain so much productivity by having way, way simpler mocks. Sometimes even just sort of injecting a closure that just returns a string saying, well, I wanna read from a cache and I'm just always going to return the exact same string because all I'm checking is that the function is being called and that the result of that function call is being used. No need to define a mock cache object, no need to conform that to a protocol or make instances of it or configure it to return something. Just inject a closure that returns a constant string and you're done. So that can be quite nice. Now, if you're injecting a lot of closures into an object, this approach can become quite tedious again. We can actually use a type alias to wrap our uh, dependency closures together into a single tuple that's almost like an object. For example, we could use a type alias dependencies inside of an object, and then that type alias could be a tuple of a bunch of different functions. We can actually have a named tuple, so that means that we can actually have something like get the user profile, user settings, update settings, and all this stuff, which is quite nice because now it almost looks like we're injecting a single object into our um, struct again, except we are using uh, closures so that we can easily mock out functionality if and when needed. Now this greatly reduces the amount of code that we need to have when we inject our objects or inject our closures. And let's actually go ahead and take a look at what the call side of this looks like, because I've shown you, shown you a couple of examples of the objects that depend on functionality but what does it look like to actually create an instance of this object uh, and passing all these closures? So initialization is definitely going to be a little bit more wordy than it is when you're using uh, protocols instead of closures. But here's an example of initializing the, the view model that you've seen before. What I'm doing here is I'm making a let view model and I'm injecting um, a lot of closures into it. So you can see how I'm injecting a get profile closure. I have a weak self in there. And then what I do inside of the closure is I call my networking get profile info. And that's kind of the pattern that I have for every single closure here is I define the closure and then I call whatever function I want to call. So this is a lot more complicated than just injecting a networking object into the view model and letting the view model call whatever it needs to call. But it is worth scoping like this because if your view model has access to an entire networking object, it's not trivial to make sure that the view model only calls what it's supposed to call. It's quite easy actually to have your view model creep its scope of what it depends on on the networking object and call more than it needs. And maybe the networking is not the best example but not having that boundary where you say, oh, this view model only calls the user profile functions and the user setting functions, and instead having the view model have access to a lot more, right? So having that access control is really nice. Of course, it is a sacrifice in terms of flexibility because now if your view model does need to call something else on a dependency, you have to update your dependency type alias, you have to insert a new closure, you have to call that closure and all of these things. And so that is not always great if you wanna move fast in a very small team. In larger projects though, 
sacrificing flexibility is usually a pretty good thing because being super explicit about what a view model needs to depend on or what any object really needs to depend on and what it can and cannot do means that making changes to that is going to be a lot more explicit. If you want to add a new dependency to an object, you're going to have to update the initializer, insert a new closure, have that closure be injected from wherever you call it, provide functionality that's needed and all of these things. Especially in a larger team, that can be a very good thing because you don't want everybody to just make changes to what an object can do uh, without coordinating that at least a little bit and without being a little bit explicit about that. So when you're using design patterns like a factory pattern, that can really help you compose these closures together, right? It makes initializing your objects a lot easier because the factory will have access to all the dependencies, like be very broad, and then it can make very narrowly scoped objects. Now, if you're using something like the factory pattern, then that factory is going to be around for a very long time, usually in your app. And notice how we captured self weekly and the closures before. Now, we typically don't need to do that because a factory or whoever really creates this view model object that I'm showing you here is probably going to stay alive or around for much longer than the object that it's creating anyway. So the factory probably stays around for the entire life cycle of your app. So even if we capture self strongly in an object that it creates, that won't prevent the factory from going away because the factory is not going away anyway and the object that it created can just be deinitialized anyway. So knowing that, we can simplify that code that we're looking at by a lot. Here's how it looks. What I'm doing here is I'm injecting the functions that I want to call directly. So instead of calling networking get profile info inside of a closure, I'm just injecting networking get profile info. It's important to realize that doing this has an implicit strong self-capture. The function itself is now going to capture self strongly. And that's completely fine because the networking object and the factory object are both going to stay around for a much longer time than the objects that they create. So that's no problem. Of course, I realize that this is very dangerous to some folks and there's actually going to be conventions and certain teams that would not allow you to do this. And that is completely fine. If you want to use weak selves, you can totally do that, but please understand that you don't have to. And in my opinion, slapping weak selves on every closure just because that's how you've been doing things is not always the best thing because you're sacrificing readability and you're sort of creating code paths that cannot happen, right? The factory cannot go away before the object that it created goes away because the factory stayed around for the entire life cycle of your app. But that's a whole different discussion. If your team really wants to use weak self, you totally can. It's not going to impact the functionality of what we're doing here, right? We can still inject closures and even just functions like you just saw into our objects. Uh, and we can either use weak self or we, we can omit that, whatever pleases you. All right, all right, let's wrap this up because dependency injection is something that you'll have to deal with in some way, shape or form in pretty much any app of any size. Every app is going to have some dependencies that you're passing around, often through the initializers of objects or the SwiftUI environment, but you will be passing them around. And if you're careful about your testing strategies, you will be using protocols to abstract your dependencies in a lot of cases. However, in this video, I've shown you that you can use closures instead, which is sometimes referred to as protocol witnesses. Now, there is a trade-off to be made when you swap your protocol dependencies out for closure dependencies, because now you're injecting explicit functions. You're giving closures to an object and you're saying this object can call that, it can call that, it can call that. And when you're making instances of these objects, you're injecting closures, which does take a lot more code than just injecting an entire dependency. Of course, that's, that's a trade-off in terms of flexibility versus readability where the closures are a little bit less readable and a little bit less flexible but they do provide easy mocking, flexible mocking. So you're sacrificing some flexibility, but gaining it as well. And overall, I feel like it can really improve your code base. Not in all cases though. If you have a very small project, probably you don't need this approach. If you have a large project with many developers, you're probably fine with sacrificing a little bit of readability and flexibility in favor of having more predictable, easier to test, and just overall more rigid and explicit code. 
I'd love to know your thoughts on using closures instead of dependent or instead of protocols for dependencies. So make sure to comment down below. Don't forget to check out my concurrency course if Swift concurrency is something that you're interested in. And of course, make sure that you subscribe to this channel to see future videos. And I'll see you in the next one.